Without further ado, I would like to officially open this session today. Uh, a very warm welcome to um, the Wage Indicator Slide session at the, o at the ninth OECD Forum on Due Diligence in the Garment and Footwear Sector. Um, today, we have a full program of Wage Indicator people from across the world uh, who will be talking uh, uh, to you today about workers-driven social responsibility, uh, compliance and implementation of living wages in uh, in the garment sector. And we have two specific examples from Indonesia and from Ethiopia. Um, today, um, we will first kick off with an introduction uh, from our team in Ethiopia. Then we will uh, continue with a presentation from our team in Indonesia and their work experience. We will have a presentation from Professor Kea Tijdens and our data analyst, Ni uh, Ashia, uh, on wages, working conditions, or working hours and decent work in uh, factories that are associated or work on corporate social responsibility. We will have a presentation from Marta van Klaver on uh, the mapping of the garment supply chains uh, with specific perspectives from Indonesia and Ethiopia. And we will have a short uh, presentation by Professor Rob von Tilder and Bonnie Oster on um, the implementation of living wages in the garment sector and specifically focus on how companies in the garment sector uh, are working on, uh, on, this, uh, on these issues. Um, like I said, we hope to have some time at the end uh, for plenary Q&A, uh, but if you have questions already during or after the presentations for the presenters, please feel free to ask them in the chat and our presenters and our team will be uh, aiming to uh, to answer your questions immediately already. Um, so without uh, further ado, uh, I'm now happy to introduce to you our team from Ethiopia, Ewell Mekonen and Gasha Tesfa, who will be presenting their experience in Ethiopia. Ewell, you have the floor. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon or uh, good morning. Uh, I hope you have uh, a great Day. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Yuel Mekonen uh, from Wigen Cater, Ethiopia, and working as a project coordinator in Ethiopia. So, uh, me and uh, my colleague, Dr. Gashaw, who is also here with us today in this session, uh, are monitoring improvements in workers' wage and labor law compliance in the Ethiopian government, uh, garment industry. So, uh, if you have uh, any comment or question, please feel free to put it in the chat box or you can stop me at any time. Uh, next slide, please. So, uh, Ethiopia uh, is the second most densely populated uh, country in Africa uh, with a lot of uh, the age group with between uh, 20 up to 45, which is uh, most of it is the young uh, population in there, and with the high unemployment rate, the government transformed uh, its economy uh, from agriculture to industry, uh, which was like uh, until 1991, there were only 90 factories. Uh, so uh, with high unemployment rate and uh, with high manpower, uh, the government prioritized uh, the textile industry. Uh, and in addition to the private industries, government built more than 30 industry parks and created more than 83,000 job opportunities for this manpower. Next slide, please. Next slide, sorry. Yeah, uh, so uh, our project here in Ethiopia, uh, the project flows or steps uh, for the distant work check and the cost of living uh, service looks like this. The first step in the flow or the, pro the project flow is factory identification. So uh, the first step factory identification will be made by the factories, uh, garment factories, uh, will be identified by the wage indicator team together with trade union and textile federation, textile and garment federation. So after we identified uh, the factory, the next step is uh, the first wave of data collection. So uh, in the first wave of data collection, uh, service will run by the us, me and Gasha, uh, and together with the federation, uh, we will go to that uh, factory, that specific factory, and we will conduct the distance work check survey. And at the same time, uh, cost of living service with people living in the same region. 
where the uh, the distance work check survey will be made. So uh, the third one, after we collected the first the first wave of data collection, uh, there will be a data-driven social dialogue. So what we basically do is uh, we will upload uh, our uh, collected data to our system, and the data will give us a summary report uh, based on that uh, data-driven. We will have a social dialogue together with uh, Textile Federation, HR, CEOs, uh, the trade union representatives, and together with the uh, uh, government representatives as well. So after that social dialogue, uh, the next step or the final step will be uh, data collection or second wave data collection, which uh, will be conducted by uh, wage indicator. So it is basically the same as the first wave uh, questions. The questions are the same, but uh, what are the improvements after the social dialogue? That's uh, what we check. Uh, so uh, this is the project flow. So uh, the next one, uh, distance work check uh, participants. So uh, our project uh, period was uh, five years, uh, starting from January 2080 up to January 2023. So uh, in this period, uh, we uh, we, con we uh, discovered 68 textile and garment factories. Uh, we have observed more uh, 68 textile and garment factories with the total workers of. 2,319 workers were interviewed in this project, and 70% were female and 30% were male. So uh, these are the areas uh, of improvement before uh, social dialogue. So these are the main things, like uh, when we col we conduct the first wave uh, of data collection. Most of the time, uh, we have uh, observed that. Uh, employees were not given uh, sick leaves. Uh, there were no uh, free protective equipment and fire extinguishers and something like that. And some even uh, were not hired in the fixed term for fixed term uh, job. Uh, so, so uh, most of the time, uh, sick leaves, uh, collective bargaining agreements, where employees were not like uh, allowed to have uh, this kinds of tick. So after the social dialogue, we have seen a lot of improvement on sick leave. Uh, for example, there is one example uh, in a factory in Adisawa, and there were uh, no fire extinguisher uh, when we conducted the first wave. So after we uh, did the social dialogue, and when we checked for improvements, uh, the factory uh, bought new fire extinguishers and something like that. So these are basically uh, more improvements we have seen uh, in the project. So uh, average weights in factories with two waves. So with two waves means we have conducted the service two times. So uh, so between these uh, two waves, there's obviously the social dialogue. So uh, before analyzing this data, uh, there were 22 factories considered for both waves. Uh, and uh, the which you can see in this uh, uh, analysis is in burr and the weights are per month. So uh, first wave, uh, there were 267 women and 101 men, a total of 368 employees were uh, considered. So in the first wave, as you can see, the average male uh, employee will earn around 2,368 uh, burr per month, and women uh, were earning 170 uh, 1,700 1, Ethiopian per month, uh, which was uh, a gender pay gap of average 668 Ethiopian per. So uh, we took uh, this data in the first wave, and after conducting social dialogue and do uh, considering the 22 factories uh, there, uh, we were able to consider 300 for women and 162 uh, men were considered. So uh, we added a, a bit uh, more in place. Uh, so in the second wave, uh, average men uh, earns 3,000 and average women earns 2,010 uh, 20 bill. Uh, so uh, we can conclude from this that uh, the gender pay, uh, both uh, male and uh, female or women, uh, have like more, uh, it was improved, the salary, their wages were improved much better, but uh, the gender pay gap still remains. So uh, we have to uh, have uh, more social dialogues uh, in these uh, specific factories to minimize the pay gap. 
Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the above uh, data analysis where uh, there is no occupations like uh, for the uh, total uh, target group, uh, there were from different departments. So this data is with some specific occupations. Uh, so we tried to uh, have some specific uh, some specific occupations, uh, and this data, uh, as was the previous one, with our permanence and in Ethiopia, number 22 factories were also considered, and with only two waves. Uh, and the occupations we selected were at least four respondents uh, per gender are considered. So, as you can see from the data, uh, production manager, human resource staff, and work. Uh, weaving machine operators, there is all uh, like almost 50% of uh, gender pay gap uh, in these specific occupations. Uh, but there were some occasions like uh, dying machine operator, uh, production machine mechanics, and tailors. They were like a uh, small pay, pay gap between uh, them. So uh, still, there is a lot of work to be done in uh, regarding this gender pay gap. So uh, the, uh, there are uh, major problems uh, in the garment sector uh, we have observed throughout these five years. So the first one is a huge gender backup, uh, as you can see from as you see from the data, there is a huge gender pickup, and uh, there is also not only gender pickup, there is employment and uh, gender equality issues uh, we have observed, safety problems. There, uh, most of the employers uh, do not uh, give employees free protective equipment. So uh, in some factories, it's under, uh, not even there, free protective, protective equipment. In some factories, there were a little, but not uh, fully efficient. So uh, there is also another problem, freedom to organize. Uh, employees uh, do not have the right to strike in some factories. Uh, and uh, do not even have a collective bargaining agreement. There is also the absence of minimum wage, uh, which I believe uh, is the main reason for the gender pay gap uh, to be here. Uh, if uh, we have a minimum wage, uh, that will be great here. So uh, workers' lack of awareness is another problem. So uh, workers in Ethiopia, uh, employees uh, which are working in the government sector, uh, they do not have uh, an awareness on their rights, labor laws, and convention conventions such as ILO. Uh, so there is also a poor government attention, uh, which is a huge, huge, huge problem in the sector. Next slide, yeah. Uh, challenges, yeah. Uh, we have uh, faced uh, a lot of challenges uh, while we uh, conducted uh, this project in the past five years. Uh, these challenges uh, like uh, fear of surveys and social dialogues and their consequences. Uh, most employees and employers fear the service and the social dialogues uh, because of their consequence. Unorganized employees, uh, we have faced uh, a lot of problems with this issue. Uh, some factories do not even have a trade union, which is a huge uh, challenge again. Uh, lack of awareness uh, of labor law uh, and conventions policies. Uh, there were some occasions where employees, uh, the factories have uh, collective bargaining agreements, but they don't know uh, what the collective bargaining agreement uh, says. So they don't fight for their rights. So that's uh, a big problem. Uh, Ethiopia recently uh, was expelled from Agoa, which affected workers and employees. Uh, some factories were even closed because of uh, this issue. International and national crising, crisis uh, skyrocketed living costs, challenged smaller wages, uh, reduced control from the government and uh, because of the international and national crisis, foreign currency shortage was uh, a big problem here in Ethiopia. Because of that, uh, factories were closed. Uh, we uh, factories uh, do not export their uh, produced items, and traditional leadership practices were the major challenges we faced throughout this year. So, our future. What do we see in the future? Wage Indicator team, uh, Ethiopia team, would like to uh, expand this uh, project to other untapped areas. So uh, our uh, previous project, which is ended in the January 2020, where 
focusing on three main regions in Ethiopia, Addis Ababa, the capital city, Oromia region, and Southern region. We would like we'd like to uh, expand this to other untapped areas in Ethiopia and conduct a monitoring and evaluation assessments, address uh, the gender pay gap issue in social dialogue meetings, uh, expand the distance work check and social dialogue to other factories such as PP factories and other like shoes and laser uh, factories as well. So uh, we also like to impact the government, the government to set minimum wages, uh, which we believe could solve many, many problems. So uh, we also would like to research why national labor laws and international conventions are not obeyed in this specific uh, sector. So uh, we also like to see better working environments where rights and privileges of uh, workers or employees are respected. Next slide. Uh, so a special thought uh, goes to the project manager, Brano McConnell. Without him and his precious work, this would not have been possible. Uh, we would like to uh, thank you. Thanks a lot to and, uh, yeah. the Ethiopian team. Um, I'm, uh, we will share the, the slides with everybody. So if you want to get in touch specifically with the Ethiopian team and have questions for them, feel free to ask them in the chat, but we will also share the slides so you will be able to uh, uh, to contact them. Now we yeah. uh, go, thanks a lot, Ayala. We go directly to the Indonesian team. Um, Lydia and Dela, you have the floor. Go ahead. Thank you, Viana. Good day, everyone. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to share the work of uh, what we've done in Indonesia on this forum. I'm Dela from Gajimu Indonesia part of Wage Indicator Foundation. I'm here with Indonesian team, Fifi, Lydia, Andina, and also some of our interviewers here, and also our former project manager, Nadia. Hi, Nadia. All the presentation here show our program, Workers Driven Social Responsibility, Compliance and Implementation of Living Wages in Garment Sectors. This is a collaborative program with Trade Union Rights Center Indonesia, Wage Indicator Foundation, FNV Mondial, Lotus Foundation, and three biggest government trade union in Indonesia. This is a uh, next slide, please. This is an approach to improve working condition within the factory by using workers driven data for social dialogue with management and monitor working condition across supply chain. Through this program, we assist the trade union to do data collection on factory compliance directly from workers, provide trainings to analysis and use the data for negotiations, and publish the result and development online for public to access and monitor the progress. In addition to responding global and national issues, we also do research on how the COVID-19 crisis affect working conditions and research on the textile garment and footwear factories mapping in Indonesia to get information on the relocation destination as a result of labor law reform that promotes flexibilization working conditions. Next, please. So this is the flow of the approach. We started with data collection and then data training using data for evidence-based social dialogue in bipartite meeting and collective labor agreement negotiation with factory management and monitoring the improvement independently by the workers and trade union. Here is the program intervention. Next slide, next slide please. From year 2020 to 2022 on information outreach, data collection, training, lobby and advocacy. We have some testimony from workers in PT Kots Rejo. PT Kots Rejo, it's a textile factory in Bogor, West Java. He said in the past, when negotiating with management, you use your muscles, now you use your brain and data. And also testimony from HR management of PT Dinsius. PT Dinsius is a sport footwear factory in Karawang, also in West Java. She said, I prefer when I prefer it when union officials come to bipartite meeting fully prepared and supported by good data and arguments. Next slide, please. On data collection interview intervention, 
we can see some effects of design work check survey. A uh, result from this and work check survey shows categories in local regulation that are being implemented in the factory according to the workers. The data is accessible to stakeholders where it can be used to trigger social dialogue within a factory. So this is the average change in factories with less than 90% compliance between 2021 and 2022. Of all topics, compliance increased by an average of eight percentage point. The highest increase in compliance is in wages and working hours. Another effect that we can share is, in some factories, the survey succeeded in becoming the entry point for organizing trade union member by raising awareness of decent work. Next slide, please. To create improvement within factories, social dialogue is needed. Whenever factories use the survey finding in their social dialogue, we take note on which topic discussed and whether the agreed topic considered improvement by trade union. By monitoring the social dialogue report, we covered more specific topics that are not captured by the decent work check surveys. From this social dialogue report data, we could track trends changes and improvement agreed within a factory over time. The amount of social dialogue report received by Gajimu from 2020 to 2022 increased every, week, every year. A total of 1,274 topics were discussed in more than 170 factories, where 755 topics were agreed and 392 deemed to be improvement according to trade union official. Next slide, please. The topic most discussed in social dialogues are wages or remuneration, job security, working hours, and company facilities. Next slide. Another data collection that we want to raise in this forum also is ma factory mapping. The mapping was carried out at 1,487 textile garment and footwear factories in Indonesia using open apparel registry database as a basis. The aim is to map industrial areas that are the destination of factories relocation. The mapping starting with 1,121 factories minus duplicates and factories outside Banten, DKI Jakarta, West Java, Central Java, DI Yogyakarta, which are the five provinces targeted for the surveys. It was found that 775 factories were still operating, 140 factories were permanently closed, and three factories were temporarily closed. Factory location that close a lot are in West Java and DKI Jakarta, while most of the factories that are still operating are in West Java, Central Java, and Banten. Based on the sector, most are in garment and accessory sector. Last slide. In conclusion, we added lesson learned to what we've done in Indonesia. One, the evidence-based or database advocacy model encourage the position of both parties trade union and also companies to be equal in conducting collective bargaining. Two, encourage the position of both parties, trade union and company, to implement accountability and transparency in their factory. Three, start to expand the target factories to non-unionized and non-partner factories, where surveys and other interventions succeeded in becoming the entry point for, for organizing trade union members in factory. That's why we plan a call to action in the next initiative, such as uh, use data gathered by Gajimu to assess the situation at suppliers and advocate for, betting, for better working conditions, intense collaboration with more garment trade union in Indonesia for a focused effort to scale up and penetrate factories without union, especially in developing industrial areas in Central Java, and also support local evidence-based social dialogue with independent trade union. That's our exposure. Hopefully the lesson learned we had could be added and applied in other countries as well to create bigger impact. Big thanks to all the team involved in realizing this. Thank you.
Thanks a lot to Dela and the Gajimu team and happy to have a lot of the data collectors with us from Indonesia here as well. If you have any questions for the Gajimu team, please feel free to ask them in the chat. Uh, we're now going to give the floor to Professor Kaya Tadis and me, Asha from, from Wage Indicator to discuss uh, wages and working conditions. Yeah, thank you, Fiona. Uh, this is uh, Kea Tijdens and Niashi from the Wage Indicator Foundation. And we are studying the data of the Decent Work Check survey that has been discussed in the previous two presentations. Uh, because we want to know whether corporate so social responsibility in the global value chain has an effect on the working conditions of the workers in the factories. So CSR organizations urge brands to act on CSR. For example, the platform of living wage financials or ACT, um, quite some brands are a member of those CSR organizations. Uh, so do these organizations successfully urge their members to improve working conditions in the supply and factories? The problem is that the brands, oh sorry, the brands don't have uh, an employment relationship with the factories, but a purchasing uh, relationship. So therefore, we want to know what the effect is of the CSR membership on brands and wages. Next slide, please. We have two research questions. Are the wages, hours, working hours and decent work? better in factories that supply to international brands compared to, complete, compared to national production or and does CSR membership of a brand affect wages, working hours and decent work in the factory supplying these brands. Next slide, please. So we have used the data from the decent work check survey in Ethiopia and Indonesia. And we have uh, used the membership list of five CSR organizations. Uh, so we have basically data on workers, their factories, the brands and the CSR membership. So within the whole supply chain, this is a four level, uh, four level uh, approach. So next slide, please. Now it's Ni Asia who will uh, detail the findings. So hello everyone. Um, so for our first research um, question, which was um, are wages, hours and decent work better in factories supplying to international brands? Um, we, we looked at the factories that um, supply to international brands versus those who produce for nat uh, national production. And what we found was that um, wages are not higher in factories that supply to international brands, both in Ethiopia and Indonesia, um, that work and that working hours are longer in factories that um, supply to international brands. So when um, the factories supply to international brands, the workers tend to work longer hours. But also we found that um, decent work is better in factories that supply to international um, brands. So for decent work, we, we captured decent work under five um, broad categories. So um, their work time, um, their, their contracts, um, health and safety in the factory, um, social security, and um, fair treatment. But we also looked at other factors that could um, that could affect decent work wages and hours. So we also looked at um, the if the workers are covered by a collective agreement. We looked at the age group of the workers, the size of the firm, um, the gender of the workers. Um, their level of education, and if they work in the capital or if they work in um, central Java or, or Romaya in um, Ethiopia. Next slide, please. Um, for, for our second research question, we were also looking at um, wages, hours, and decent work, but for factories that supply to international brands 
who are a member of these um, CSR organizations to see if they impact the working conditions of the, the workers. And what we found was that um, wages are not higher in factories that supply to CR, CSR members versus uh, non-CSR um, CSR members in Indonesia. However, um, working hours are longer in the factories that supply to these CSR uh, members, to the organizations that are mem members of the CSR organizations. But decent work is better for both Ethiopia and Indonesia for these factories that supply to um, CSR uh, members. Next slide. So um, in conclusion, what we came, to, uh, what we concluded was that workers in factories um, supplying to international brands have more decent work, but they work longer hours and their wages are not affected. Also, if these international brands are a member of one or more CSR organizations, the workers have, um, they have decent work, but they work longer hours. We found this in Indonesia, um, whereas their wages are not affected. So um, our study shows that um, improving wages are challenged by other factors than the supply chain characteristics. So there are other factors that we, we should consider um, in improving wages aside these supply chain characteristics about the international supplying to international organizations. And that our, we have shown in our study that um, the supply chain can be disentangled uh, using data that allows us to identify workers in their factory and the brands that these factories supply and the brands of the CSR membership. Thanks a lot, Geani. Uh, I can imagine that some uh, uh, might have questions on the on the results of this uh, this study. So, if you want to discuss more with Gea or with me, please feel free to ask questions in the chat or email them uh, later on. Uh, we now move on to Mart van Klaasa, who um, has mapped uh, the global garment supply chain. Mart. Thank you for Fiona. Um, I will. Um briefly go into the conditions uh, in the world market in which the Indonesian and Ethiopian uh, garment uh, industry is in. Um, next slide, please. And I start with Indonesia. In fact, I include textile and footwear and leather industry uh, as a lot of statistics uh, in both countries cover this GTF industry completely and we also built uh, a database uh, on all these uh, factories and the brands behind them as Nick just explained uh, in the uh, broader uh, industry. Uh, and I will briefly run over the history, very short. In fact, uh, concentrate on 2010 and the current uh, business and then you can see that uh, the development of the exports and the employment in Indonesia fluctuates quite heavily. And in some years like uh, 2017, between 2020 decreased. Um, and this suggests already that there are structural problems in this industry, uh, like for example, in textiles, the lack of uh, finishing capacities. I'll come back in the next slide on this. The position of Indonesia in the global GTF supply chain. Um, uh, if you look at the Indonesian export in general, you can see the last year in 2022, a huge um, export growth, nearly 30% or overall. And also you can see that especially the export of textiles improved. Garment lagged a little bit behind, still Indonesia is a player in the world market with 1.5% of the world export value. Uh, but still, these exports are rather uh, at risk at the actual. Remarkable effect is that the total export of GTF 
uh, is 70% of the uh, production in Indonesia, with, uh, and of course our imports as well. But you can see that the, um, uh, the uh, sales in Indonesia itself to the Indonesian population is relatively fallen. And this is especially the case for garment, which is uh, something uh, which can be worried about. It's worrisome uh, if you look at the position of the Indonesian population, of course. Um, exports, you can see that the last years, uh, sorry, uh, not that quick, uh, garment is lagging behind, as I say, but textiles and footwear and leather is increasing. Employment, that's of course quite important for us. The, uh, the figures are a little bit outdated, but we can see that uh, three years ago there was a total of 3.6 million uh, people in Indonesia involved if, uh, in this production, with half of them, 1.8 million in garment, which is, of course, uh, still quite an important employer in Indonesia. Many of these people in the three in uh, sub industries are employed in small firms. Just over half actually are employed in firms of less than 20, per, uh, 20 people. Yes, next slide. Interestingly, um, we, as, we, as I said, we have a database with factories, uh, employers and brands behind it. And then I compared the behavior of the brands in between 2018 and 2022 for four brands. This is quite interesting because you can see different developments. If you look at first Adidas, um, on the one hand, they are uh, usually expanding their existing factories, but at the same time, they uh, are a little bit exiting from Indonesia. Um, the same holds even more for Gap, American clothing producer. The factories are expanding, but um, a, a number of uh, factories are no longer in uh, producing for Gap. CNA and H&M have a little bit uh, a different uh, option. The factories stay the same size. Uh, uh, CNA has some new factories and uh, even more um, on balance H&M uh, has. Uh, it can be noted that CNA and H&M share a lot of suppliers in all countries where they are uh, supplying uh, of. That may be interesting. Uh, interesting, of course, are what are the perspectives for especially the garment industry in Indonesia? If you can see uh, in our database, uh, there is an ongoing relocation to areas with low wages inside Indonesia, especially to central Java. Um, and uh, that uh, poses, of course, the question, uh, Indonesia is quite vulnerable for competition from real low wage countries, uh, such as Vietnam and also China, and especially uh, Bangladesh. And how can Indonesia, with their current wage levels, uh, successfully upgrade? There are some examples in ILO studies like Morocco and Romania. And it may be interesting for policymakers, uh, both in the industry and in the government of Indonesia, to look at this problem. And of course, uh, including the trade unions in there. And that's also the question which role will they play? Something about uh, yeah, next slide, that's okay. Uh, something about e Ethiopia. Ethiopia has already quite some history in attracting foreign investors in uh, the garment industry, uh, especially through like uh, uh, my colleague from Ethiopia, you already indicated uh, in industrial parks, the biggest one, the Hawassa industrial parks, um, which was quite special case because even there, a brand, BVH, the US brand, invested themselves uh, into that uh, factories in that park. There has been quite some criticism, which is largely um, uh, also in the uh, DWC uh, research of the wage indicator, the lack of decent housing, the low wages, 
uh, especially fueled by the fact that Ethiopia has no statutory minimum wage, and uh, especially the fact that uh, middle management is especially uh, foreign and have uh, much uh, low, uh, low uh, participation of uh, Ethiopian citizens. Um, still, uh, garment is an important factor in the Ethiopian industry, 6% of the total export value. And uh, the current um, uh, developments are quite worrisome, uh, as already indicated. There is uh, a civil war still going on with uh, ups and downs, and uh, it influences quite some industrial parks, like the Hawassa Park. Um, uh, even PVH, which was a forerunner, announced uh, two years ago or one and a half year ago that they would close uh, the Hawassa garment industry I, uh, got factory. I understand they didn't do it fully, but okay. And uh, a number of international brands and owners uh, of factory uh, factories uh, cite the war situation as a main reason to at least consider closure and uh, uh, going out of uh, Ethiopia. Anyway, without these uh, developments, this may be give bleak uh, perspectives, but anyway, there are still hopeful signs as already presented. Uh, and we do hope as a wage indicator that oh, Ethiopia will reach peace in a short time and will continue this progressive industrial development. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Marta, uh, for your presentation. And like with other uh, presenters, if you have further questions for Marta, feel free to ask them in the chat or send in an email later on. Uh, and we will share all the presentations as well, so you can take your time to uh, go over them in the end. Um, we now move on to our final presenter duo, um, Professor Rolf van Pilder and Pauline Osso, who will share a little bit more about wage indicators work on living wages specifically for the garment sector. Pauline, you have the floor. Hi, um, good, uh, good morning, good afternoon. It's Pauline also Wage Indicator Foundation. Um, let me quickly tell something about living wages and then the relation with, um, with the garment industry. Wage Indicator has a, a substantial database on living wages in um, now 148 countries. Um, and the living wage as we have it, is connected to the minimum wage database, the labor law database, um, and the collective agreement database. So if we present whether it's for um, brands in the garment industry or brands in construction, we present always a living wage database connected with the other, other databases, as such that you always know that the living wage is there for a country where they usually work 40 hours or 48 hours um so it's it's connected and we, so there is a reason for it and it's connected with um, um low medium high skilled wages as well and obviously with minimum wages um this database uh, is for quite a lot of brands quite interesting because these brands also brands in the garment industry they are keen to focus on living wages. They're keen to start creating a policy on living wages. And they're keen to know that as soon as they really start paying living wages, what will be the cost? Um, so therefore they knock on the door of Wage Indicator. Why Wage Indicator? Be because we have a global database and not a database just for only global South. And global means that you, we also cover uh, countries like whether it's Romania or Moldavia, Moldavia or Turkey, but also Bangladesh or Pakistan. So we can cover um, for these brands who are working either in the US or in Europe, but also uh, somewhere in Asia. So that helps them. Um, very quickly, our database of living wages is not so different from other databases in terms of uh, what is in our basket. Um, the basket um, for the cost of living on which we work out the living wage um, has, of, of course, food, water, education, clothing, healthcare, housing, very important, energy, transport, uh, phone, internet, um, and a bit for emergency. And of course, it's the, the taxes are calculated. 
We do this uh, for a standard family and a typical family. Typical family, by far most of the brands who knock on our door, by far most of the NGOs who knock on our door, they use in the end typical family. And typical family basically means that it's a bit adjusted for um, the situation, let's say family size in um, a, a country, where it's two or so in the Netherlands is less than two, but in some countries it's more than two, it's sometimes three or four kids. So then it's adjusted, So which basically means that the living wage is a bit higher when the family is larger. And, um, can I have the next slide? Um, super short for you. If uh, brands or NGOs knock on our door, what can we do? We deliver quarter on quarter data. So that can be Bangladesh, can be Pakistan, or can be Moldova. Um, quarter on quarter data, which means you can each quarter anticipate on whether um, uh, cost of living is going up or is going down um, to have a stable a vision on what is really happening with living, living wages we deliver. Um, yearly averages, and these yearly averages are exactly the numbers which are used by brands to focus on, to say, if we want to start our, uh, implement our policy to pay the living wage, then we focus on year average 2021 or year average 2022, etc. Uh, so it's really used for that. For new clients, so new brands who knock on our door and say, please, please, can you help us to set up the policy for living wages? First step is usually that we say, well, let's let's have a, a quick scan whether there are major problems for all your countries and locations around the world. Then we do a quick scan between minimum wages and living wages. On that basis, um, you you know the usual suspects. Let's say it's no wonder that Myanmar is a is a major problematic country if it comes to let's say the political situation the situation the labor law but also the pay gap between minimum wages and, and, and living wages that's no wonder for no one then um, okay um finally what we can do and do is let's say calculate later the gap between the salaries and uh, the living wages and then come with uh, little solutions, let's solution scenarios, how to how to close these um, gaps. Well, and there are more issues like that. We share a lot behind the screens information from one brand to another. So a lot of brands also in the garment industry talk with each other. We know them. We know that they uh, are working on living wages because they have our database, and we um, bring them in touch with each other to that's it to solve problems. How do you fix? it in Bangladesh? How do you fix it in Pakistan? These issues, and now I come to the next slide, and that's the final slide. These issues are exactly the issues that um, at this moment, brands are also not in our meeting. We invited them all, and they uh, we have a very close relationship with them. But to be in the meeting and to explain to all of you what they do with living wages, is at this moment an issue for them? Because very often they say, well, we, we, we work on it, but we're not yet that far that we can guarantee in all countries that we pay the living wage. If we can't guarantee, then I bet you one of the organizations will knock on my door and say, hey, why don't you pay in uh, Pakistan or why don't you pay in Bangladesh? So that's why they work behind the screens. We, we know they work hard, um, but they don't want to do it in the open. There are more reasons why they want, don't want to do it in the open. And the blunt reason is that the gap is huge. That's a gap for, for instance, a company company like Philips or Accenture is smaller, but the gap, uh, let's say, gap between minimum wage or actual wages and a living wage in the garment industry can be substantial. Because it's substantial, you need to take your time to make sure that you can guarantee to your workers, to the trade unions, to employers, to anyone in the garment industry, wherever buyers and uh, consumers that you guarantee it. So they, uh, I would say, there's a, they are kind of afraid. There's another issue which is, um, I think, almost solved. That's the issue that there are different data providers and they bring in different numbers for living wages. So one is a bit higher, the other is a bit lower. And obviously, if there is that confusion, then if a brand um, doesn't have that much money, they will focus on the lowest, which looks like a race to the bottom. 
And if it comes to living wages, obviously you don't want that. that um, so that is, a, a, it's a confusion of which number you should, should you take. We as Wage Indicator took the initiative to have people together, data providers together, end of the month to discuss this and hopefully to overcome it for the rest of everybody is uh, live, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, the, I, would, I would leave it here um, and invite Rob, Rob von Tilder, um, to come and give a reaction on what do we do when do we have, for God's sake, living wages in the garment industry? Because if there's any industry where it's needed, it's the garment industry. And maybe Fiona can explain a bit more who's Rob, or will Rob do that himself? Uh, I think Rob can perfectly introduce himself uh, fine. Uh, but Rob is one of, a, one of the professors that focuses a lot on, uh, on the SDGs in relation to, uh, to companies and businesses. Uh, so Rob, uh, to finalize and round up our, uh, our list of presentations, we would like to ask you the question, why do you think it's important for companies to start paying a living wage? And also what steps do you see uh, that they have to take in the coming years to make it happen? And thanks Fiona, thanks Pauline, also thanks for the invitation. And I think in the timing, I have minus two minutes for this, I think, so I, I will keep it brief. Uh, also, for your information, I just uh, put on the on the scan on the chat uh, a reference to a book that we just released, which actually talks about the strategic relevance of SDGs, uh, uh, sustainable business models, and where the living wage is one of the key elements in in a whole strategic consideration. So let me give you four reasons why paying a living wage is important for companies. It is shown also by research that if you have a value chain in which everybody gets a fair wage or a decent work, which then also composes of a living wage, it is a more resilient, a less vulnerable value chain. Uh, also, as we know, strategically speaking, companies looking for due diligence, and that's of course the OECD language is avoid doing harm, is too low a common denominator, which also means that you're running sort of behind the facts and, and minimum wages are not decent wages and are not uh, living wages. They are a political compromise, which then draws you into a sort of reactive approach where you are have to change your policy all the time. So the adoption of living wage by front runner companies, and we know there are a number and, and, and the wage indicator has a number of those contexts, is clearly also creating a more strategic logic in the and the predictability also of the business model, but it's not easy. So companies also have to address other issues. Now, that's why you see investors are taking living wage now more and more as a key litmus test for the bigger story. So if you're able in your company and in your value chain to strive for living wage, you probably also have a nexus. This is what we call the nexus to other SDGs. So that's SDG 8, right? decent work, poverty, reduced inequalities, but also gender inequality or gender equality, uh, uh, other elements. Interesting study also by the SHIFT uh, uh, Foundation, uh, the, the Rugby uh, Foundation, together with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. They looked at living wage and they saw immense nexus effects also in the business model, but also, of course, in the societal uh, models that then are organized around living wage as a sort of key performance indicator. They call it people-centered approaches, which of course, I think everybody can relate to if you think about how you deal with also the crisis that we face on a global scale. Finally, the, the last element is regulators. Of course, when the European Union starts talking about the CSRD, yeah, the, uh, the, the uh, Corporate Social Responsibility Directive, they're not only looking at a sort of ethical idea on, on what the economy should look like, but they also look at that, this is what is called double materiality, that single materiality, which is due diligence, responding to some of the societal challenges. You have to also do it the other way around. Think of what the societal challenges are in the midterm. That's, still, of course, the SDG agenda. Think about how you create a, a, a fair economy and, and also a thriving economy, which is not based on exploitation, but on, on, on a, say, a, a link between labor and capital, uh, between big companies, small companies, between uh, communities and companies. And then you can see double materiality means you strive for a societal goal, which then living wage is an important part of, and then link it up to present strategies. So then the question is, 
what step to take? That's the second part of your question. Well, actually, uh, there are a number of examples already. So companies trying to get out of the due diligence approach, really strategize, use the living wage as a means to strategize. That doesn't mean it's easy. So you can see also that companies are using it as an agenda for internal change, then creating coalition, partnering platforms, then also create transparency in the data. And of course, that's where more uh, a standardized approach to international uh, living wage data is really important because it will create a level playing field in the data gathering, which then can uh, uh, help companies and the front runners are doing it at, the, at this moment to create a sort of level playing field in claims, in transparency, but also in engaging others, so stakeholders in that common trajectory, which is not easy, but in any case will not be then hampered by a fight over uh, uh, who is right in terms of the of the data, uh, 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 and because we see that all the time, eh? we are start, uh, we see many companies are fighting over key performance illusions, actually, instead of key performance indicators, because they just play the ranking game instead of just trying to make their business models more resilient and more sustainable. So that, that would be my story, Fiona. Thanks a lot, Rob, uh, for this. And uh, with that, uh, we also <laughs> very much want to thank you uh for your attention today i realized um and it's a, we have a we have a stop at 12 so thank everybody for your timing uh we realized that there is a lot a lot a lot of information that we shared today um which is one of the reasons why we uh recorded the session so if you want to listen back to all of the presentations that's possible um we will also share like i said all of the presentations so you can go through uh, some of the results from the studies and the work of the team um, in Ethiopia and, and Indonesia as well uh, at your own pace. Uh, please feel free. I saw a lot of nice questions and discussions already in the chat. Please feel free to reach out to the team members or to our central email address, office at wagemicator.org. If you have any questions or if you want to discuss more, um, we officially have to stop at 12 now. Um, Feel free to drop out if you have to. Now I, I am aware that some people have other sessions to attend as well at the, at the OECD uh, forum. Um, if you have a burning question for one of the team members and you want to ask it now, uh, that's also possible. And uh, um, hope to see you next time and uh, hope to uh, be in touch soon. Uh, thanks a lot.